This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Lydia. Um, and I just want to um, also just appreciate all of the work that Lydia has done organizing this session. It's been great working with her. And I think we've got some great information for you here today. So I'm going to start us off by talking about recognizing common natural enemies of pests because we felt like this was information that would be relevant throughout the rest of the session. Um, so I have basically just two goals for today's talk. I wanna go over just a couple of definitions, make sure we're all on the same page so that throughout the rest of the session, um, I and other speakers aren't throwing around terms and you're not sure what they mean. And then we're gonna spend the rest of our time practicing recognizing some common natural enemies of pests. As Lydia mentioned, you can ask questions in the chat at any time. Um, I do have my chat window up and I can see it while I'm watching the slides. So I'll try to keep an eye on that. Um, and uh, as we appreciate all of your participation already in that Zoom poll, I will ask you to continue to participate today. So just consider yourselves fairly warned on that. All right, and so here's your first opportunity to participate. When you hear the term natural enemy, what comes to mind? I'd like you to go ahead and find that chat button. If you don't see it, you might need to hover over either the bottom or the top of your screen. Go ahead and click on that chat button and type your answer in and hit enter. Uh, and I'm just curious what you think about when you hear natural enemy. So the responses that we got um, were good bugs. And I think that's a good way to describe natural enemies. Um, so what is a natural enemy? Uh, it's related to this concept of biocontrol or biological control. Biological control just means using something living to control pests, and biocontrol is just a short way of saying that. And so uh, ladybugs and aphids or lady beetles and aphids are commonly thought of as an example of biocontrol. And in that example, the natural enemy or the biocontrol agent is the good bug, the lady beetle that is eating the pest, which is the aphid in this situation. This is also a good time for me to mention, especially if there's some entomologists on the call, um, throughout today's talk, I will be using the term bug a little bit loosely. So entomologists know that bug has a very specific meaning, but everyone who's not an entomologist tends to use bug just to mean something creepy crawly. So although insects have six legs and spiders and mites have eight legs, and so technically we might call them all together arthropods, throughout this talk, I will probably use the term bug to refer to um, both insects and other arthropods. So there are a few different types of natural enemies. Natural enemies can be predators, not pretty, most of us are familiar with the concept of a predator. So the insect biocontrol agent is catching and eating a pest or maybe feeding the pest to their young. Lady beetles are a great example of predators, but also spiders, ground beetles, and there are some wasps and a whole lot of other insects that are predators also. There are also parasitoid natural enemies. And I'm not gonna say anything else about this because Lydia is gonna cover parasitoids in our next talk. Um, and she's got some great uh, images and videos for you about that. And there are beneficial nematodes that are natural enemies. And you're gonna hear from Kyle Wickings about that a little bit later in today's session. Today, we will not be talking about herbivores, which would be insects that eat plant pests, although there are certainly some natural enemies that do that. Um, and some people, you know, we sh often when we think about natural enemies, we think about insects, bugs, um, Technically, natural enemies could also be microbes, but we're not going to talk about that side of biocontrol either today, um, especially not in this talk. I think uh, our final speaker, Sam Wilden, will touch on it a little bit. All right, so now we're all on the same page with definitions. Let's get to some practice of recognizing some common natural enemies. Um, and I like to do this with the good bug, bad bug game um, because this is more interesting for all of us. So the way we're gonna do this is um, something that is called a waterfall in the chat. So I'll ask you a question, I'll show you a picture and you're gonna tell me if it looks like a good bug, a bad bug or a neutral bug. And you're gonna type your response into the chat but you're gonna wait and I'm gonna give you a countdown. Three, two, one, and everyone's gonna enter at the same time. 
what that will do is that you'll see this kind of waterfall of responses and then you don't have to worry so much about if your answer is right or wrong because no one's paying attention to who gave the answer we're just seeing these this list of responses go by I all right let's get started okay so here's our first picture we've got a um, shiny insect it's got uh, mostly red covers on its wings with some black spots a black and white head does this look like a good bug, a bad bug, or a neutral bug? And I'll give folks a moment to send me a direct message. Someone asked if this was a trick question. It's not a trick question. I wanted to start off with an easy one. Set you all up for success. Yeah, I'm seeing uniformly everyone is saying, yep, this is a good bug. And you are all correct. Um, so this is a lady beetle, also called a lady bug, also called a lady bird beetle. These are natural enemies that eat a lot of soft body pests, including aphids, white flies, serps, mites, um, eggs of insects. The adults can also feed on pollen or nectar. And there are a lot of different species of ladybugs and they come in different colors and sometimes different shapes. So this pink spotted lady, lady beetle, ladybug, is not quite the classic ladybug shape and look that this seven spotted lady beetle is. It's actually a species that's native to New York. Um, there is also, a, so here's a picture of a checker spotted lady beetle, not native, but still a natural enemy. Multicolored Asian lady beetles, if you have had lady beetles that are in your house, that are um, a pest in a structure, it was probably a multicolored Asian lady beetle. They're still natural enemies, they still eat pests. However, they can be a bit of a nuisance inside. And you can distinguish them because if you look on this part of the insect that's called the pronotum, you'll see an M. I don't think it stands for multicolored, but that's how I remember. All right, what about this one? This uh, insect is black and orange, it's a little bit spiky. This look like a good bug, a bad bug, or a neutral bug. Seeing some responses coming in. Most of the responses are saying this is a good bug, and I would agree with that. So this is actually the same insect. It's also a lady beetle. Lady beetles look very different when they're immature larvae, though, compared to when they're adults. So here are two different species of lady beetle larvae. They tend to be a little bit spiky. They're often black and orange or maybe black and yellow. Um, and they have these kind of elongated bodies. They are great predators when they are larvae. And then they go into a resting stage called uh, pupa or pupae if there's many of them, multiples of them. Um, and they just sit there, they don't do anything. They attach to leaves, they attach to other surfaces, but it's important that you are able to recognize these so that you don't see them and think this is a pest you have to do something about. Spiders and harvestmen are another good bug, not technically an insect, but a good bug. They will eat a whole range of arthropods, including some beneficial. So oops, this spider here is actually eating the small bee, which is unfortunate for the bee, but that is the way nature works. Um, they, depending on the species, they might also feed on nectar or pollen. So the difference between a spider and a harvestman is the body shape. So this spider has a distinctive kind of constricted waist between the head and the body. The harvestman does have a head and a body, but it looks like it's just one single blob. All right, what about this one? This is a green insect with wings that are kind of look like nets. All right, most of the responses that are coming in are saying good. I'm gonna ask you about one more insect before I give you the answer. I like the emoji response, that's excellent. Um, so here's another insect. This one is kind of shaped like a lady beetle larva. It has got really big jaws. If you can't tell, this is the head of the insect. Those are its jaws. It's kind of brown and pale yellow. Does this look like a good insect, a bad insect, or something neutral? Most of the responses coming in are saying good, and I would agree with you. This is another situation where the two different life stages of this insect look very different. So here's an adult lacewing. This one's green, although some are brown. And this is a larval lacewing. Looks completely different. Um, and those jaws look kind of intimidating, but those jaws are for eating insects 
not for hurting you. I suppose if you bothered it, it might give you a little pinch, but it wouldn't hurt much. So lacewings also eat aphids, mites, thrips, white flies, other small insects. Um, all of the larvae are predators. In some species, the adults are predators also. Uh, and the adults will feed on pollen and nectar too. And here's a larva that's hanging out on a flower. The other thing to note about lacewings is it's good to know what the eggs look like. So lacewing eggs are always at the end of long stalks. So if you see these on your farm, then that's a good sign you have some lacewings that will be hatching soon. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on wasps, except to say that my rule of thumb for wasps is that if it's not hurting anyone, leave it alone. So obviously, if you have a nest of yellow jackets or hornets that's in a space where they're gonna be contacting people and they could be stinging them, you have to do something about that. But if they are someplace away from people where they're not posing a stinging risk, these yellow jackets and other social wasps are actually good predators. They'll eat lots of insects. Um, there's a lot of solitary wasps that are very, very unlikely to sting you and they're parasitoid wasps, which Lydia will talk about shortly. What about this one? Good bug, bad bug, or neutral? It's got this kind of distinctive pale yellow and brown striping pattern with some diamond shapes on its back. I'm seeing a mix of responses coming in. Some people aren't quite sure, some neutral, some bad. I suppose it could depend on what you're growing. So this is a tarnished plant bug and they can definitely cause damage on some plants, including fruits and flowers. Um, they, so here's some tarnished plant bugs that are actually damaging a Coreopsis flower. You can't so much see here, but the flower is misshapen. Um, and they can damage strawberries and some other crops as well. So if the tarnished plant bugs are something that could be damaging your crop, then they would be a bad bug. As far as I know, they have no particular benefit. Um, so if, they're, if you have a crop that tarnished plant bugs aren't a problem, then they could be neutral in that setting. What about this one? This one, I will tell you, is a um, zoomed in magnified picture. Uh, it has kind of a black, it's black towards the front, and then it's got sort of a white triangle towards its rear. It's got eyes that stick out on the side of its head and got a pointy nose. Seeing a mixture of good bug and bad bug responses here. This is a minute pirate bug, and these are good bugs. They are very tiny. They're no more than a quarter of an inch long. And just for a size comparison, this is a zoomed in picture of the center of a cosmos flower. And here's a minute pirate bug on that flower. So very, very small. Um, they will eat other small insects like aphids, mites, thrips, um, and some insect eggs. Both the adults that are black and white here and the nymphs that are bright orange are predators. And they can also feed on pollen and nectar, which is one reason that if you have um, flowers that have produced a lot of pollen um, growing near your crops, you might see minute pirate bugs on those plants. And then I have a little video of a minute pirate bug running around the maze, um, running around a map of a corn maze. That was kind of the most exciting part of the corn maze for me, was finding minute pirate bugs. All right, what about this one? Good bug, bad bug, or neutral? It's got really big eyes. It's got just one pair of wings and its body is black and yellow striped. I'm seeing a lot of good responses come into the chat. Some neutrals, some question marks. This one is a hoverfly, also called a surfeit fly. And for this insect, the adults will um, feed on pollen and nectar and they're important pollinators. So they're visiting some flowers here. And the larvae are great predators, especially of aphids, but also of white flies and scales. Some people think they look a little bit like bees and some species really do, like this one that has a fatter body. However, they have bigger eyes. They have just two wings, whereas bees have four. Um, they are black and yellow often like bees. And if you watch them outside, they do have a distinctive hovering pattern, especially around flowers. There are a whole lot more predatory and parasitoid flies that I'm not gonna cover today, uh, partly because their identification is a little bit tricky and partly because we just don't have time. Um, this group, the surfids, are pretty easy to identify um, and so I'd like to include them. 
And I want to tell you about two other natural enemies that you're, they're probably in your soil that are sometimes hard to notice unless you're looking very carefully for them. So rove beetles, which if you have a greenhouse, it's possible that you've used some rove beetles in your greenhouse for biocontrol. Um, these eat a lot of different soil invertebrates, including slugs and snails, and also um, thrips and some insect eggs. Some of them will also eat seeds. The way to distinguish them if you get a close look is these are actually the hard wing covers like a lady beetle would have on its back, but instead of covering the whole abdomen, they only cover the first part of the abdomen. And here's those short wing covers here too. Um, I think it kind of makes the beetle look like it's wearing a little cape. Carabid beetles are a really large group of insects. They will eat a whole lot of different arthropods as well as snails and slugs and seeds, including weed seeds. Most of them live on the ground and they tend to have really prominent jaws, which you can see well in this picture here. They're often brown or black, um, at least on top. These tiger beetles are kind of iridescent green underneath and they're generally very fast. A lot of carabid beetles will actually chase down their prey like a cheetah. You can kind of think of them as the cheetah of the insect world. This was certainly not an exhaustive list. There are a lot of other natural enemies out there. I wanted to focus on some of the um, natural enemies that are the easiest to identify um, and some common ones. Um, but I will post some links in the chat um, after my talk uh, where you can find some more information about identification. Um, and one of the resources that will be linked is this app called iNaturalist. Um, and you can actually take pictures of Thanks, Lydia. You can take pictures of insects with this app or plants as well, and it will try to identify the insect or the plant from the picture, or it'll tell you it can't tell from that picture. It's not perfect, but it's a good place to start. It can give you more information for um, doing a further search. Also, um, please take advantage of your local extension experts. All right, we're going to do one more poll question. So this is kind of to see what you have learned. Um, Go ahead and launch this. So I've got some pictures up here. I've got 10 different insects and they're all labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. So on the poll, if you could mark all of the letters that are natural enemies, um, that would be great. And I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you up front, we ended up not covering this J insect, so you can skip that one. This is a leaf hopper, just so you know. So I'll give folks a moment to respond to that question. And I will go ahead and put some links in the chat while you all are responding. Um, this one is a pocket guide to natural enemies that you can print out yourself. It's free online. Um, and I'm also gonna post links to two blog posts I've written that go over this information. So if you wanna refer back to it later, um, it's pretty similar information that I've covered in these blog posts here. All right, I know that we need to move on to the next speaker. So um, I am going to show you what the answers were. So everything here is a natural enemy, except for this tarnished plant bug here and this leaf hopper over here. And with that, I appreciate your time and hope you enjoy the rest of the session. All right, so I'll get into my presentation. Um, so again, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Lydia Kamandi. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Entomology. Um, today I'm going to discuss parasitoid wasps, the body snatchers of the insect world, um, and a little bit about their biology, ecology, and how to support local populations. Um, so to outline some of the topics I'm going to discuss first, um, we'll touch on what makes an insect a parasitoid. Um, we'll learn then how to recognize them in the field, We'll discuss how they can be used in agricultural settings relevant to you um, and how to uh, attract and support populations. And so if you have any questions at any time during the presentation, don't hesitate to drop it in the chat. Um, so just to give some definitions before I get into it, I'm gonna be talking about eggs, larvae, pupae, and adults. And so I just wanna explain that in the context of eggs, I'm talking about clutches of insect eggs right here. When I talk about larvae, I'm basically talking about little caterpillars or worm-like insects as they are developing. They're the immature version of insects. I'll be talking about pupae, which are basically like the chrysalis of a butterfly when it's developing before it becomes an adult, and then obviously adult insects, as you can see here. 
Um, so to begin, Amara did a great job of explaining the benefits um, that natural enemies bring to our ecosystems. And in this presentation, I'm going to focus specifically on parasitoid wasps, um, which are a type of natural enemy. However, I did want to define a few different types of organisms that fall under this broad umbrella of natural enemies or beneficial organisms. Um, this can include insects such as beetles here, wasps, um, arachnids like spiders or mites, nematodes, viruses and beneficial bacteria, predators like mantids. And then to begin, um, you know, a parasitoid is often an insect that facilitates the development of their young on or within the body of another host. In this case, it's often insects pests. Aphids are a really common example of insects that are targeted um, or targets of parasitism by parasitoid wasps. Um, but parasitoid behavior by insects is thought to be really one of the most gruesome behaviors in the animal kingdom um, and was even used to write the plot of the alien movies. And so I'll get into that a little bit later and why. Um, so parasitoids, which are often insects in general, have characteristics of both predators and parasites. They hunt their prey and they attack. However, uh, a pretty large or significant difference between parasitoids and true predators is that parasitoids don't kill and consume their victims. Um, instead, they lay eggs within the body cavity. Um, and so the eggs then develop into larvae and consume the host insect's organs slowly and carefully um, while allowing it to live until they're pretty much ready to emerge, which is pretty creepy. And when insects are targeted by parasitoids, their offspring develop um, in, you know, within the insect body, sometimes within the body, and then they come out and pupate outside of the body. Um, and so you can see in these pictures, the craziest part about these parasitoid offspring is that they're very careful not to kill their insect host until the most opportune time, which allows them enough time to fully develop into adult wasps. Um, and lastly, there are parasitoids that target really every life stage of the insect from the egg to adulthood. So nobody is really safe from parasitism. Um, it's important to note that there are multiple species uh, of insects that can parasitize living hosts from beetles to flies and wasps. Um, however, parasitoid wasps happen to be the most abundant, successful, and diverse group of parasitoids. So we'll just be focusing on them for the remainder of the talk. Um, so here's a little bit of background information on parasitoid wasps that I mentioned earlier. Um, they're beneficial insects as they're able to reduce populations of insect pests. Um, there are over 60,000 named species of parasitoid wasps and the estimated number of undescribed species is over 600,000, um, which really speaks to the size and the diversity of parasitoid wasps as a group. In terms of insects in general, about 10 to 25% are thought to be parasitoids. Um, with wasps comprising the largest group of parasitoids, but to consider the vastness of this behavior, it's hypothesized that for every insect pest, there's at least one parasitoid species that is biologically synchronized to parasite, parasitize that pest. So in terms of identifying parasitoid wasps in your region, there's really no tried or true rule um, other than the presence of maybe a wasp waste. Um, because they can be very diverse in size, color, and even with their markings. Um, however, they don't look like a typical paper wasp or a bee with the yellow and black striped markings. Um, they're often, like you can see here, black or brown. Um, their whole body is black or brown, and they have the presence of an ovipositor. And an ovipositor is here in red. It's a fancy name for a modified stinger or organ. Um, that's basically a tube that delivers the female's eggs um, and they're deposited into the victims and they're also used to impale their victims. Um, and so that's how the wasps lay their eggs. Um, because ovipositors are part of the female reproductive system, female wasps are responsible for 100% of the parasitism behavior. Um, and unlike some of their ant, bee, or wasp cousins, parasitoid wasps don't live in new social colonies like bee colonies. Um, they're solitary, it can often be seen flying alone, searching for nectar, which is what the adults feed on, um, or looking for hosts to parasitize. So like Amara mentioned in her presentation, iNaturalist is a really good app you can use to identify parasitoid wasps or other natural enemies. 
Um, it's one of my favorites because it's also used to identify plants and other animals, not just insects. Um, but Bug Guide is also a website that you could take advantage of, or like Mara mentioned, your local experts. Um, so I've talked a little bit about the fact that parasitoid wasps can parasitize every stage of an insect's life, um, but I wanted to give you an idea of the life cycle and the process um, because I think it's pretty cool. So first, um, the female wasp usually mates to fertilize her eggs with a male wasp. Um, she then searches for a viable host. So in this case, she would be looking for insect egg clutches. This could be stink bug eggs. Um, usually that's a pretty common parasite. Um, it's kind of like a Russian nesting doll of parasitization because the female wasp lays her egg within the egg of another insect. Um, and then she leaves her offspring to develop without her and they begin to develop within the host's egg, consuming the tissue of the original host um, and then emerging when their development is complete. And what's interesting about larval parasitoids in particular, similar to egg parasitoids, um, is that the female wasp locates a live larval host, which makes it just a little bit more gruesome and personal, um, but they behave similarly to egg parasitoids. So now I have a video to show you guys. Let me know if you have volume. This wriggling little guy is a baby braconid wasp. It's bursting out of a cottonwood dagger caterpillar and starting to spin a cocoon. Believe it or not, this somewhat gruesome scene is part of a healthy, balanced ecosystem. Until now, the caterpillar served as the wasp's food and nursery. Braconid wasps are parasitoids. That means they first infect, but eventually kill their host animals to survive. Regular parasites generally don't kill their hosts outright. The cycle begins when a parasitoid lays eggs inside or on the caterpillar or on top of the caterpillar's food. As the larvae hatch and grow, they feed on the caterpillar's internal organs. They often save the most important parts for last to keep their host alive. Some parasitoids, like this tachnid fly, grow to nearly the same size as their host before bursting out. After emerging from the caterpillar, these parasitoids pupate and develop into adults. Then they search for a new host to lay eggs, starting the cycle over. Parasitoids have a special purpose. They keep their host populations in check. Without them, the caterpillar population could skyrocket out of control and destroy the trees that they eat. Some parasitoids are used to help control invasive species and pests that otherwise could devastate the environment. So they can help keep the ecosystem healthy. Sometimes helpful things come in wriggling packages. Okay, so hopefully you're not too grossed out by that video. Um, so now that we have a complete picture of how parasitoid wasps live and reproduce and you've got all the visuals, um, we wanna know how they can be used in agriculture. Um, so we know that they're able to reduce insect pest populations. Um, and they're known to do this in a range of habitats worldwide. Um, this behavior has really become a point of focus for biocontrol experts. Um, and it could be implemented in agricultural systems in the future pretty successfully. Um, but in addition to agricultural services, parasitoid wasps serve as pollinators. Um, and they're not exactly as efficient at pollinating as bees because they don't have a lot of the fuzzy hairs that are responsible for taking pollen from flower to flower. Um, but they still are a pollinators um, because the adult wasps feed on nectar and can take that pollen from plant to plant. Um, despite that, um, there are some little fun facts here. So it has been shown that parasitoids are able to you get through your um, they're able to pick up plant cues via chemicals called volatiles. 
Um, and this is basically when the plant is telling them that a pest is present and can help them spot and parasitize insect pests more effectively. Um, so the next four slides really just contain examples of parasitoid wasp species that may be of value to you, um, depending on what pest problems you have. If any of you have green stink bugs or really any stink bug problem, you may benefit from populations of Trisulcus basalis, which is a parasitoid of stink bugs. Um, and it's an egg parasitoid, like I mentioned earlier. Um, the stink bug, the green stink bug, is a pest of many cool crops, nightshades, specialty crops, flowering plants, and grasses. So you would benefit from increased parasitism of their eggs in your garden, greenhouse, or crop field by this parasitoid. The allium leaf miner is a pest of many high value allium crops um, and the parasitoid Helicopter seculus may help reduce populations of pupating flies, um, which can help reduce yield loss. However, I should note that this species of parasitoid is not found abundantly here yet, but that could change with um, increased biocontrol programs. The leek moth parasitoid, similar to the allium leaf miner parasitoid, um, Diadromus plochellus, um, is also a very efficient parasitoid of the pupil form of the leek moth, which is also a pest of alliums. Um, and lastly, the European corn borer parasitoid, Ariborus terebrans, is a really effective parasitoid against the European corn borer, which is a major pest of field and sweet corn varieties. Um, these are just a few examples of parasitoids that target insect pests just in this region. So if you're interested in parasitoid wasps or pests, um, and you're struggling to control them, you can always search for information online like Cornell's biological control website, um, or you can contact local experts like Amara for more information, um, which leads to my next slide. Yes, they are available for commercial, commercial purchase. Um, so Copert, uh, Planet Natural, and Arbico Organics are just a few of the companies that are currently rearing and selling some species of parasitoid wasps. Um, however, I should note that these applications are primarily intended for greenhouse use, um, so you can retain these populations. Um, and Amara will be including a few links to these companies in the chat, maybe after the presentation or during. Um, so if you're looking to support populations, if you don't do any greenhouse work um, in your garden or fields, here are a few tips um, uh, in, to welcome these beneficial wasps. Um, so the first is providing an adequate source of water. This can really encourage beneficial insect populations, not just parasitoid wasps. Um, and this can be in the form of bird baths, ponds, creeks, even ditches on your property. Second is maintaining floral resources for the wasps. Like I said, the adults feed on nectar um, and they rely on these flowers throughout the summer to sustain their populations. So that could really help. And lastly, is habitat. Providing some non-crop habitat for these wasps um, to forage for nectar is really helpful and it can encourage populations, but more importantly, populations of other beneficial insects, not just parasitoid wasps. Um, so in addition to providing resources for parasitoid wasps, it's important to make sure that if you're managing your crops, your management tactics are compatible with parasitoid wasps and other beneficials. So insecticides are often not compatible with beneficial insects as the ingredients formulated to kill them are the same as the ingredients formulated to kill the pests. Um, so for this reason, you should use insecticides as a last ditch effort when you've really exhausted all other management tactics. Um, but if you do have questions about the insecticide risks um, to non-target beneficial organisms of the products you're using, you can refer to the EIQ of the product you're curious about. Um, the EIQ is the Environmental Impact Quotient, which is basically based on a formula um, that's been created to determine the impact um, a product has on the environment or natural enemies. So for more information on the EIQ, you can refer to the New York State IPM page, which Mara will also link, um, and this will give more information about EIQs and how they're used. Um, and in addition to that, you know, always read product labels carefully and follow all recommendations. That's the best advice you can give. Um, and so as a takeaway for the presentation, although some parasitoid wasp species are very successful at reducing pest populations, um, parasitoid wasps are not a complete cure for severe pest outbreaks. Um, instead, they're just a tool in the IPM toolbox that should be used in conjunction with other tactics if necessary. And in summary, um, we defined some parasitoids. We learned how to recognize them and identify them. 
Um, we examined how they're used to control pests in the most gruesome way possible and how to attract and support these populations so we can keep them around year after year. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank Amara Dunn, Brian Nault, and Kyle Wickings for their oversight on this project, um, the Extension Outreach Assistantship Program through the Department of Entomology for funding me, um, and then the Nault Lab for their feedback and support, and you guys for listening. Let me know if you have any questions. You can drop them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. That's great, Lydia. Thank you. Um, I, I know there was an avalanche of um, messages in the chat with links. Um, one of them also included a link to a Google document where we have all of the links from today's session um, so that if um, that's an easy place for you to get your hands on the resources that we've been sharing during the talks. All right. Well, then, if there's no questions, I will welcome Kyle Wickings. He's our next up presenter. Um, he's assistant professor of soil arthropod ecology and turf grass entomology here at Cornell Agritech, and he's going to be talking about nematodes today. Take it away, Kyle. All right. Well, I hope you're all enjoying looking at larvae popping out of larvae and all that cool stuff. We're going to talk a little bit more about that now. Um, so as Lydia said, I'm, I'm Kyle Wickings. I'm the turf grass entomologist here at Cornell, and I'm a soil ecologist. So I do a lot of work with below ground animals and, and insects, and part of that work involves managing below ground pests. Um, there's a lot of below ground pests and turf grasses. Actually, most of the ones we deal with feed on roots and, and below ground parts of plants. But um, I, what we'll talk about today, I think carries across to just about any commodity where you've got below ground pests that you're trying to manage. So some of my research program focuses on using what we call biocontrol nematodes or entomopathogenic nematodes. And that's what we're gonna talk about specifically today. We'll sort of get into their biology and their, their ecology and talk about strategies for using them to control critters that plague your crops below ground. So I wanted to start just by talking about the basics of nematodes, because I think there's a lot of confusion about them and misconceptions about what nematodes are. Um, so the place to start is just in their overwhelming abundance. This is probably the most abundant animal on earth, and they're incredibly numerous in a lot of different ecosystems and over 80% of animal life that you encounter on earth is a nematode. So, um, and especially in soils, they really, really do well in soil as a habitat. And there can be over 2 million of them in a single square foot of soil, which is hard to, hard to picture and hard to fathom. But there's a really good reason we don't recognize this and that's because of their small size. So they're, they're pretty much microscopic organisms, uh, typically less than a millimeter long. So very easy to overlook, but what they lack in size, they make up for in numbers. Beyond their numbers, they're incredibly diverse from species to species. Some of them are really important crop pests. And I think this is where a lot of the confusion comes in. Because when you hear a recommendation to try using nematodes to manage a pest, you often think about nematodes that have uh, been pests in their own right in, in the crops that you work in. Um, nematodes like sting and lance nematode and the golden nematode, they can be really important. Uh, pests of plants, but we're talking about a whole other species and range of uh, ecological group of nematodes here. So they're very, very different. Um, but just to kind of, I guess, set the stage there to talk about how broad they can be ecologically, I think that's important to know. But nematodes can also be predators, they can feed on bacteria and fungi, but then there's this really unique group, the entomopathogens or insect pathogens, and that's uh, what we're going to focus on today. So it, it gets that name because entomo means insect, and it's not really a pathogen, but that's sort of the name that's stuck with them. Um, the entomopathogenic nematode itself is not just the nematode, but it's also these bacteria that live in the gut of the organism. And without this symbiosis between the bacteria and the nematode, the biocontrol function wouldn't actually happen. So you're we're really talking about multiple organisms that have a symbiotic relationship to make this function work. And if you think about it, the nematode, they're really, really mobile in soil. They're kind of like aquatic organisms and they, they can move very, very well through the soil matrix if it's moist. And they're kind of the vehicle for moving these bacteria around. And as you'll see on the next slide, it's really the bacteria that do the, the killing. So the grody part. So this is the, a generalized life cycle for entomopathogenic nematodes. And we'll walk through it just from the top, starting with this nematode at station number one. Um, so there's a, a life stage for these nematodes where the, the individuals are free living in the soil and they're really mobile at that point. They rely on water films to swim around and move and, and seek out hosts. 
but they contain that symbiotic bacteria in their gut at that point. So they're moving around with that symbiont in, in their gut looking for an insect host. And they can find those hosts through a lot of different means. Typically, they'll use chemical cues to find them. And when they do, they'll colonize the organism. And, you know, I guess sticking in that theme of nasty interactions, this is another one. So they'll, they'll swim through the, the mouth, the anus, the spiracles, where the insects breathe through to enter the body. And when they're in there, they'll release these symbiotic bacteria into the insect. So these bacteria aren't all the same thing. And based on the species of nematode, you might have different species of bacteria that live in the gut. And they're not bacteria that you commonly find living free in the soil. They're actually very dependent upon these nematodes. So it's a, it's a really important interaction for the bacteria as well. So once inside, we're talking about the stage two over here. Once inside the insect, they'll release those bacteria and the bacteria produce a toxin to kill the insect. Um, and at that point, they release a whole array of digestive enzymes to break that insect cadaver down into sort of a nutrient broth that they can feed on. So we have all these bacteria that are reproducing um, from that, those nutrients they just created by killing that insect. And this takes, it can take five to 10 days or so for this death to happen for the insect. Um, kind of depends on the species and the conditions, but that's a rough estimate of how long it takes. And then at that point, the nematodes will feed on the bacteria as they're reproducing. So they're sort of farming their own food out of bacteria. Um, after that, the nematodes will reproduce and then they will emerge out of the cadaver in dramatic fashion. So they sort of burst out of these cadavers to go find a new host and start the whole process over again. So that's the general life cycle for this process. Um, like I said, until by the time we get dead insects from you know, infection to their death, they can take about five to 10 days, which is important to think about when you're you know, deciding whether or not this is a, a useful tool for you. If you need something that will kill insects much quicker, this may not be the most feasible. So something to keep in mind. Beyond that sort of shared life cycle, there's a lot of differences at the species level in these nematodes. And it's important to talk about this um, because it really depends on the type of pest you're trying to manage, which nematode you would select. So um, as Lydia was talking about in her, her uh, slides before me, there's a lot of commercial sources for these nematodes, and there's gonna be three typical species you see available from these, actually the same suppliers that Lydia mentioned, um, specifically for EPNs or entomopathogenic nematodes that control soil dwelling pests. So the species here are Heterobditis bacteriophora. This is a mouthful, so it's often abbreviated HB or H bacteriophora. Um, and the others are Steiner nema feltii and Steiner nema carpocapsi. So you'll often just see these abbreviated. And sometimes the abbreviations HB, SF, or SC are incorporated right into the name of the product. So you know, keep an eye out for that if you're looking through some of these products. So Aside from being annoying to pronounce, there's some really important ecology among these species that really impacts your selection of a nematode if you want to control a particular pest. So, uh, and just to kind of draw attention to that, in some of the most extreme cases, we have some entomopathogenic nematodes that live really shallow in the soil and they stay very localized. So you might use a nematode like this, such as Steiner nemocarpocapsi, to control an insect pest that's right at the soil surface or just below the soil surface, kind of up in the crowns and the roots, uh, upper root zone of the plants. Um, and we, they're often referred to as kind of like an ambush predator, but they mostly just will stay somewhat localized in their activity. So now that might not be the best nematode to use for a mobile deep dwelling pest like these scarab beetles or white grubs. This is, this is a pest that my lab works with a lot in, in turf grasses. So for a pest like that, you would want a much more mobile and a much deeper dwelling nematode, like the heterobdited nematodes. So you'll see language on the labels for these commercial products talking about which pests they'll control. Uh, and the products should be listing the actual nematode species as well, so you can reference that. But just to point out that it's, a, it's actually, you really wanna pair the nematode well with the, the pest that you're looking to manage. So really important step. Um, here's another list. Some of this crosses over with what Lydia pointed out and, and some web links. And I can get some of this information to Amara as well if we want to post more. But there are a lot of places to order entomopathogenic nematodes from. And we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of what you actually need to look for when you get them um, in a bit. But just to point out, you'll see a lot of vendors for these. Some of these producers create their own nematodes and, and have processes for rearing them in their facilities. Others will 
by nematodes produced by someone else and repackage them for sale. So, but these are some of the, the really common ones I've got posted here. And typically you'll see NIM somewhere in the name when they're uh, on your product names. I want to talk a little bit about formulation and mixing because you can get these things. It's very different than you know looking at um, some of the much more charismatic biocontrol agents because you don't really see the nematode when you buy it. You're buying something that looks like a chunk of sponge or a packet of gel beads, um, and it's really hard to know you know what's actually in there. So I think it helps to orient everybody to you know what is the material you actually get the nematodes in. So sponge material is used often. The nematodes will be packed into that sponge, and you just wash them out with water. Um, there are a number of different types of granules and pellets that they'll pack nematodes in, and this helps protect the nematodes during shipping and keeps them preserved later on. Um, and most of that is water dispersible material. There's also, you'll find them also in gels and vermiculite, and you, you really don't choose that. It's sort of what the facility uses to pack their product in uh, to increase its longevity. So, but there's a lot of variability in what you'll, what you'll get them packed in. And unopened across the board for these different materials, you'll see differences on the packages in terms of how long they'll tell you you can store them, but it's very easy to get them to, to last for months. And we found that unopened, as long as they're not opened up, you can get them to last at least a month up to two. So it is different than some of the chemical options that we have out there, which can be stored easily for months on the shelf. There's a much shorter time clock on these things. So something else to keep in mind. Once the packages are open, regardless of the style here, it, it's the, the clock gets even shorter and it is something that you want to use relatively quickly. And that's especially true for once they're mixed with water. You really don't want to mix them uh, with water until you're absolutely ready to go and make an application. And even then you want to use that material within about two hours of having mixed it together. So something to keep in mind is just thinking about how does this compare in my, my timeline uh, compared to how I might use a chemical option. Um, when you get the product, there's usually pretty good information on the package as to how to handle it. And you'll see language on the, on these packages, uh, referring to refrigeration, some nematodes, uh, it will have instructions saying just to keep them in a cool, dark place, but typically refrigeration is the main step to improve their longevity and shelf life. Um, they'll also list use by dates on there as well, mostly for if you haven't opened it yet, but some will also talk about how long you can keep it after you've opened it. And they're general guidelines and they're usually pretty conservative too. But you'll also see the packages talk about limiting exposure, especially to UV and temperature extremes because those, they're very UV sensitive um, and also temperatures above 100 Fahrenheit and uh, below freezing will, will definitely kill the nematodes. So that's why refrigeration is probably the best bet. But even if you have all of the boxes checked on these factors and everything's good, it's really important to check the viability of these products when you buy them. And it sounds like a daunting thing, like how do I get this pack of vermiculite and find nematodes in it? It's, it's actually not that difficult. So what we do in our lab is we'll often take a, open the bag, take a very, very tiny scoop. I mean, like if you were gonna sample a hot sauce and use a toothpick, something like that, like just a very tiny amount, mix it in with a half a mug of a uh, coffee mug of water, lukewarm water, stir it up and let it sit for about an hour. And then we will take a little bit of that material and look at it under a hand lens. And you should be able to see the nematodes in it. They're gonna be small, but you should still be able to see them. We'll use a microscope in our lab, but you can get by with a, um, a decent quality hand lens as well. So the nematodes should be waving in appearance, sort of have a lot of S curves in them or be spiraled up. And you should be able to actually see them wriggling, not thrashing violently, but wiggling a little bit in the, in the water. And that's a good sign they're alive and active. You will also see dead nematodes in there and they have kind of a hangnail appearance to them and they won't be moving at all. There are occasions where you'll get entire packages of nematodes that are almost all dead. And that's not obviously intentional on the vendor's part, but it's something to, that you wanna check on. Because if you do all this work to select the right nematode for the pest, time it right and all that, you wanna make sure you're about to apply a live uh, product to the field. So. So check it. Um, if the majority of them are dead, then you just contact the company. They will quickly overnight you uh, a new batch to, to work with. So really important thing to check. And I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to reach out about that process because it's not as difficult as it might sound. Um, I want to talk next about application because this is another step that I think people assume must be really complicated. Like it's a live organism. You're trying to 
apply these things. It's got to be a lot more complicated than a, a chemical, and it, it really is not. So you'll see on the packages a, a range of different instructions. Some just say to put them out with a watering can and then water them in with a garden hose. It kind of depends on the scale you're trying to do it. If you're looking at a commercial field, that's not the most practical. But you can use just about any equipment you've got available to get entomopathogenic nematodes applied. So here's an example of us using a small CO2 sprayer that will apply on small plot studies. It can also be used at sort of a garden scale and, and home lawn scale. Uh, you'll see rigs with electric pumps um, on, on the back of pickup trucks. And again, just about any type of a sprayer setup you have, you can use with some general guidelines you want to follow. So you want to <laughs> roughly uh, low pressure on these applicators, not low enough that it's going to affect how well the application goes out but um, you want to make sure that it's at least lower than 300 PSI. I don't have any equipment that goes that high, to be honest, but uh, just making sure you don't have anything that's very high pressure because that will shear the nematodes and, and kill them. Um, as I mentioned on a couple slides back, you want to make sure that you're not mixing these with water until you're ready to apply. So soon after you've mixed it, get that material out. Um, and you want to be able to agitate the material as well, because like a lot of our products, um, nematodes will settle. So they're aquatic and they can swim, but they really need a water film. If they have just a bucket of water, like you see in this uh, soda bottle here, they'll just sink to the bottom. So you either need to gently mix it, like we'll turn that bottle upside down occasionally throughout the application, or actually have a proper agitator in the tank. And not an agitator that's, you're not trying to carbonate this stuff, you're really just trying to gently mix it. So because too much and it will kill the nematodes. There's a lot of different nozzles that you can use uh, for making EPN applications or entomopathogen applications. You just wanna make sure that if it has screens in it, it's a really large gauge screen or that you pull the screens out completely. Um, beyond that, you want something that'll give you large droplet size, but also give you good coverage. And there's a lot of options for that. So a decent flat fan nozzle or a solid cone nozzle will do that for you. So. We'll often also use fertilizer stream nozzles because you're, you kind of get a dual benefit. You're putting the nematodes out, but you're putting it out in a very saturated stream of water. So it's almost like you're irrigating at the same time. We, you'll see lots of different recommendations for the rates to apply these nematodes at. Um, so it'll say how many nematodes come in the package on average, and then you will use that number to determine your rate for, for the, the field you want to apply it on. And we recommend a billion per acre. You'll see different numbers there, but a billion per acre, at least in the systems I work in, tends to be the density that, um, a rate that gives you the most consistent control. So that is, that's uh, where that recommendation comes from. I mentioned a couple slides back that they're UV sensitive and that translates to how we make our applications as well. So typically we try to make our applications in dawn and dusk. Uh, Dusk is best because you've got the entire following evening for them to settle into the soil before the sun is beating back on the ground. So you can also capitalize on having overcast days, especially if they're timed with a rain event, because we, you, it's really important that you provide water for the, the nematodes. If it's a saturated site already, maybe a soil that's at field capacity moisture, you might be fine, but it is uh, important to provide water for the nematodes to move into the soil. So we'll often, if we have the luxury of irrigation, we don't always on the, the systems I work in, uh, we'll use that irrigation afterwards to water the nematodes in. Um, or like I said in the previous bullet, you can time it with, with precipitation when possible. So combined, that gives the nematodes the best chance of making it from that soil surface into the pro soil profile down to the roots where the pests are. So, so I kind of want to, talk about this um, application approach a little bit, because everything we've talked about so far, especially with commercial nematodes, focuses on what I would describe as somewhat of a curative approach to management. So think about, this is a pest I work with a lot, so I always show these slides. Think about managing a pest when you know the pest is there, it's susceptible, it's within a window where you can use all the great IPM tools of scouting and decision-making and pest identification. Uh, which is great because typically this is a great strategy for reducing how much product you need uh, and making your applications just fueled with decision. So you have a lot of, of ammo there to make an accurate decision. But when it comes to biocontrol, this can also be risky because it's a fairly narrow window of time, this red band I've um, animated over top of the box. And you don't know what the weather's going to do within that time window, and you have to be very surgical to be able to go in and make those applications at that time. 
So there's been some criticism of using antimopathogenic nematodes in the strategy because so much depends on them being able to work in that narrow window of time. And that's, that's produced a lot of results that are fairly mixed. So cases where they work really well, cases where they don't work so well, and a lot of questions about how we make them work better. So there's a lot of research trying to improve that with commercial nematodes, but there's also another approach that I wanted to just mention, because I think some of this is happening in the, the vegetable world right now that I think is just important for everybody to know about. So rather than this very surgical curative approach when the pest is present, there's also approach that we call inoculative or um, persistent use of entomopathogens. So this tends to focus more on using native strains of nematodes. And the idea being that if you're working with native nematodes, they're a lot better adapted to the ecosystem we have in New York State. So they're, they're a lot more adapted to our conditions here and the soil type that we have and should be better able to survive and perform in our system. So um, Elson Shields here at Cornell University has been doing this in a lot of field crops over the years and has kind of been pioneering this area. So I got very interested in this um, and, and started working with entom native entomopathogenic nematodes when I joined Cornell. So the idea behind this, though, is that you don't make an inoculation of these nematodes when a pest is present. You try to get them established in the system so that by the time a pest is present, they're there and able to, uh, to handle the pest. And this depends on some things. They're, they're that natural ability to weather the harsh conditions that we have, particularly in New York State, that we throw at our, our critters. Um, also, the ability to use other insects in the soil as hosts to kind of bide their time and survive in the soil. So they're, they're flexible in their diet and their ecology. And this should result in a persistent population that, that's at that low level, kind of persisting, ready to do its job at any time. So that when you do have a pest emerge, say an outbreak of a root feeding pest like white grubs, the EPNs can infect and kill it. So a very, very different approach than that curative strategy. Um, We've been doing this in a lot of different systems. It's actually a pretty interesting and fairly low tech approach. This is actually the process here. Uh, these nematodes are manually infected onto insect larvae. We buy these larvae from bait suppliers that are very cheap online. Uh, they get infected. You rinse the nematodes through a screen out of those, those infected larvae. Um, and then we screen it through a finer mesh screen and it goes directly into our application tank. And this has been used, like I said, with Elson and field crops. Um, we're doing it on athletic fields, cemeteries, um, home lawns, golf courses, sod farms. And more recently, I've, I've been told that Brian Nault has been collaborating with Elson Shields to explore this, I think, in potato systems as well. So there's a lot of, lot of uh, people right now trying to dial in this method for, um, for use of EPNs. So um, I'm going to stop there, and I know we're right about at the time we got to switch over, so I can either take any questions if people have them now, or you're welcome to follow up with me. I'm pretty easy to find at Cornell, and uh, I'd love to chat more if you have questions about entomopathogenic pathogenic nematodes. So thanks for having me. Yeah, so the two links I dropped in the chat, um, one is a blog post um, that basically just pulls together a lot of resources about using EPNs. There's information there about the work Elson Shields has done with the um, persistent nematodes and exactly how to do that, all those logistics. Um, there's links to other resources, webinars to watch. And then the second link is a direct link to a PDF document where I tried to summarize what we know so far about which vegetable pests EPNs work against. Um, because Kyle did a great job of summarizing the biology of how these EPNs work um, and we want to provide a little info about efficacy in vegetable crops. Um, so our next speaker is Sam Wilden. She's a PhD candidate here also at Cornell Agritech, um, and she's studying crop protection, specifically with low tunnel strawberries. Um, she's a member of the Loeb Lab, and today she'll be talking about some of her research. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Sam Wilden. I work on protected culture of strawberry. Today we're going to be speaking about how um, UV selective films can be used to improve efficacy of biopesticides. So this biopesticide could include nematodes, um, but also other entomal pathogens that you might spray in the field. So this talk today is about protected culture farming and specifically growing under high and low plastic tunnels. So for protected culture for this talk is more focused on tunnels and not so much on greenhouses, even though sometimes those are lumped together. But we do see that growing under, growing specialty crops under tunnels is an increasing trend in the Northeastern United States. There are many benefits that growers are reporting um, when growing their crops under these tunnels. 
And that includes protection against wind, rain, and frost, so protection from the elements. And this um, becomes more important early and late in the season when weather is pretty unpredictable. We also see that the tunnels maintain warmer air and soil temperatures inside of the tunnel. And with that, um, you can actually extend the growing season of strawberry and many other crops by several weeks to several months. And that's a huge benefit for growers. You can kind of market your, your berries during the off season and provide that to your consumers. Plastics can also be very customizable. So you can buy plastics that block or filter specific wavelengths of light that might be important to your plants or important to the, the insects and pollinators that you have, but also for the types of products that you're applying. So Kyle mentioned that nematodes are very sensitive to UV, and that's the case for many other biopesticides and also synthetic products. So you can buy plastics that block that harmful UV. So I'd like to check in with you. We're gonna do another poll here using the same type of program. I'm very curious to know what your business is like. So if you all right, I'm not seeing much more action. So we'll go ahead and cut it here. So it looks like that we have quite a few growers who do grow under low tunnels or high tunnels and a few that don't, and then a few NAs. So that's really great news to me. So this uh, talk might be a little bit of a review for you, um, but also we might provide you some new information. But for those who don't grow under tunnels, this might be an introduction to that. The second question, if you stay on that poll, is describe your experience with managing pests in one to three words. So this is kind of tricky, a little bit challenging, but try to, to think of some describing words that reflect your experience with managing pests under low tunnels. And again, you can go ahead and click on that link in the chat or scan the QR code to participate. I'll share with you my results when I get them, but some interesting things happening over on my end. Maybe I'll just share it with you guys right now. I just don't want to confuse you guys with all these different things opening, but this is a word cloud. Um, that is showing the responses and they're lumping the ones together that are common. So we're seeing hard and difficult, not applicable, um, more pest difficult, use biological insects. So the more responses we get, the more this word cloud becomes interesting. All right, I'm not seeing much more action, so we'll go ahead and cut it here. So it looks like there are difficulties. Um, so there's uh, a lot of not NAs, um, difficulty with wind, which is definitely a problem. Um, more pests, more difficult, so hard. So the consensus here that managing pests under low tunnels is more difficult. It's a little trickier um, than maybe the open field. So the question that we get um, about tunnels is do they actually promote the presence of pests? Because there have been several studies that report one trend or the other, and it depends on what type of pests that you're talking about. So we did our own study um, recently that's published in Crop Protection, looking at the proportion and presence of all the different pests that you might find under low tunnels on strawberries, so pathogens, weeds, and various arthropods, and slugs, other invertebrates. And we compared their presence on, under the tunnels compared to the open fields. And we did see that tunnels did reduce the incidence of many diseases, so a lot of foliar and uh, fruit pathogens. We did see that they protected the fruit against infestation by spiderwing drosophila. We did see that tunnels do promote higher densities of two-spotted spider mite, which is a major greenhouse pest. This pest really likes warm and dry conditions. So when you give um, strawberries a tunnel, it provides the perfect environment for spider mites to do really well. One pest that was not impacted was tarnished plant bug. Oh, oops, getting ahead. But we did see that they were a massive pest across both of our systems. They're actually the most important pest that we identified. So tarnished plant bug, I'm sure you all know about this one. Um, Lagus lineolaris, or we call it TBD, and I'll call it TBD going forward. Um, this is a highly generalist pest. Um, it can feed on many different crops and many different crop parts, depending on the plant, and it can provide really terrible damage on strawberry. In that same survey, we didn't use any management techniques at all. We just let them go rampant, and we found that 30 to 48 percent of fruit had damage by tarnished plant bug, and most of them were unmarketable. So that's a massive um, cut and yield by uh, tarnish plant bug. So it definitely requires some management. There are several options for matching tarnish plant bug. Uh, most people rely on chemical advances because it's such a pernicious and difficult pest. There are some cultural control uh, measures you can do like managing weeds that are attracted to them. Um, there are also some really great biocontrol options um, or using natural enemies against tarnish plant bug. We are very interested in microbial biological control of tarnished plant bugs. So microbial could mean something like nematodes. In this case, we're talking about entomopathogenic fungi. So including Bovaria or Metarhizium. You may have heard of these two different species. 
But we really like these two because they've been formulated into products that you can just buy off the shelf and you can apply them to your in your field using your standard sprayers. So really easy to acquire, really easy to apply. And in some cases, it actually creates some really great control. So another check-in with you guys. So this will require some chat action. Uh, we call this a chat blast, where you take one minute on your own, a quiet, quiet minute, um, to answer the following questions, but you don't click under enter until I tell you to. So we're gonna basically explode the chat with responses. So the two questions I have for you is how often do you use microbial pesticides? And second, do you see consistent control of pests using your microbials? So let's take a minute, I'll set a timer, and then don't click enter until after the, the minute is over, and then we'll flood the, the chat with responses. Okay, so starting now. All right, that is a minute. And if you can, uh, before you press enter, if you can see if you can share your chat with everyone in the meeting. So if you go to the to portion of your chat, try to click on everyone and see if that works. Um, if not, it might be directly sent to me, I'm not sure, or other people. Um, I think okay. it's still not working, Sam, sorry. Okay, you just gotcha, have to dang a verbal it. summary of the responses you get. Sounds good. Okay, then go ahead and click enter and send me all of your chats and I will summarize it best I can for you. We have, it has been a long time, um, not used against thrips, which is the primary target, maybe once a month um, in rotation with other IPM, not applicable, occasionally, never, no. So it seems like, uh, yeah, either no, never, or occasion in rotation, or it's been a very long time. Okay, awesome. Well, maybe those of you who don't use these uh, biopesticides or microbials, who don't use it very often, you might have the same issue that we have. Um, so the problem we have with these microbials, what Kyle mentioned before, is that um, the, they're very vulnerable to UV degradation, but also other environmental factors. But we see that UV is the really big one. And what happens is there's ambient sunlight, right, that comes in through the atmosphere. It hits our uh, target uh, spore. So in this case, this is the insect pathogen. And it causes the same damage that it causes to you and me. So it actually causes D DNA damage in terms of, they're called thiamine dimers. So they cause base pairs to fuse together. So when DNA replicates, it doesn't replicate properly and it creates cancers. And because the spores are so, so small and their surface area is much larger than ours, they're much more vulnerable. So the UVB, UVB rays can kill them within a few hours if they're exposed to direct sunlight. So it's a big issue. And it's not that the manufacturers of these products are unaware of. They know that this is a problem. So a lot of these formulas have additives that include UV protectants and sunscreens. Uh, but we do predict that it's still an issue because even though we still apply these uh, products, we still see kind of inconsistent results. Um, and we think that UV degradation is still a problem. So we had the idea of merging our interest in UV selective plastics and interest in improving uh, biocontrol together to see if you can use UV selective plastics to improve efficacy of a specific biopesticide that includes Bulbaria bassiana against tarnished plant bug. So what we did in the field was we applied uh, our product, we used Microtrol for this experiment to tarnished plant bug in the field. We used sentinel insects. So we put them out there and we bagged them so they couldn't leave. And we applied this under, or we also applied like uh, auger plates. So not including tarnished plant bug, just to see if, you know, on uh, regular auger plates, if the, the spores do well. We applied that under three treatments, an open treatment, um, a Dubois treatment. And this Dubois is a standard low tunnel plastic for low tunnel, for low tunnel strawberry. Um, it blocks about 13% of UVB. So it transmits most of it. And then we compared that to a plastic, a thicker plastic, and it blocks most of UVB radiation. And we applied this to both greenhouse and uh, field experiments. So we did kind of a controlled experiment and then a field experiment. And we measured spore survival of our Bulbaria bassiana. We measured pathogenicity against harsh plant bugs. So often, or how more likely um, was the pathogen going to kill the insect if it was under these three different coverings. We also looked at field efficacy to see if these sprays had any impact on damage to strawberries, but also the naturally occurring tarnished plant bug that you just find on your plants. So the ones that we might not have directly sprayed, but their presence as well. 
And here's our results. And I think Amara will be providing you handouts of our talks. And this is um, basically taken directly from the handout. So you'll have the same copy of this. So the results that we found, so when we looked at spore survival, we found that spore survival was much lower under the two treatments that transmitted most of UVB. And this included the open treatment and the Dubois low tunnel plastic treatment. And this is what the spores looked like after 72 hours. So you can see that there's only two little colony forming units here. There's a little bit more for the Dubois plastic. But we saw that for the warps plastic, most of those spores survived. And so this plate is covered in Bulbaria bassiana, which is really great news. We took this further and applied it to live tarnished bugs. We saw a, a very similar trending result. So most of the insects survived this spray when it was applied in the open fields and in the Dubois low tunnel plastic. But significantly fewer of them survived in the warps treatment. So those spores are doing much better in the warps uh, treatment and killing off more of those harsh plant bugs. For the field efficacy, the results are less obvious. Um, they, we did see the, as the same trend. So we looked at two different things, the number of tarnished plant bugs per flower cluster. We also looked at the percent of our fruit that was damaged by tarnished plant bug. And we saw a very supportive trend that the number of tarnished plant bug decreased as we increased in our UV limitation. So we had fewer tarnished plant bugs in the warps treatment compared to the other two. We also saw that yield improved as we went uh, forward in UV lim limitation. So about 40% of our fruit was damaged by tarnished plant bug, which is still really high. Uh, but this was, with, this was without any other um, uh, me me uh, management tactics. But it was better, about 8%, um, compared to the open field treatment. And the Dubois plastic was kind of in between. So in summary, we did find that Bulbaria bassiana performed better under the UV blocking plastics, and that resulted in better control of sentinel insects. Um, but we didn't really see like a very, very strong effect on the naturally occurring tarnish plant bugs. So they're still likely to invade from outside of our strawberry plots to feed on the strawberry and cause damage. And this was also reflected in the high uh, degree of damage. But we did see this kind of consistent trend throughout all of our studies that the blocking plastics did improve the efficacy of microtrol, the biopesticide tested in this study. Now I'd like to follow this up with a very brief um, debrief activity so you can reflect on what we discussed today. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take two minutes, um, quiet time to reflect on these two questions. So the first one is what parts of today's talk um, were most unclear? So what are uh, things that I could explain a little bit better? And two, what would you like to learn more about this topic? And we're gonna share our thoughts, not using chat because it's being weird, but we're gonna use the um, Jamboard function it's a really fun program. If you click on this link, it'll take you to this live document. And I'll show you what this looks like and give a brief demonstration. So it'll take you to this thing right here. And we can actually interact with each other. So what you can do to answer these questions, you can go and create a sticky note. So you click it here, click on your favorite color. I'll go with pink. And you can type in your answer. All right, and you click on save and it creates a sticky note. So you click off of this. And this is something I'd like to know more about. So I'm gonna move this over here onto this side. And if we run out of room here, there are multiple panels. So you go up here to the top, you can scroll over and there's a brand new fresh page if you want more room. So I'm gonna give you two minutes um, to reflect on these two questions. And then please use that Jamboard and those sticky notes to drop in your comments. I'll go ahead and set the timer. Sam, while folks are putting their responses in, um, I, we do want to make sure that we're respectful of people's time. So at it's 1.30 now, I'm going to ask Gemma to post the link in the chat um, for how folks can um, fill out their exit survey, which includes um, an important piece for getting DEC credits. So I want to give people the option to do that, but um, I would encourage anyone who is able to stay for another minute or two to finish out this activity. Um, that would be great. Awesome, thank you. While everyone is finishing the activity, I did want to thank all of our speakers and our sponsors. Thank you to Sam, Kyle, and Amara. Great presentations. I hope you guys enjoyed and learned some things. Um, thank you to our sponsors. And then remember to fill out the DEC credits um, and feel free if you need to go. Um, you can go ahead and hop off at any time. Just make sure you do the exit survey. And thank you guys so much. 
This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.